Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United States Army Heritage and Education Center's Army Heritage Trail for our spring field trip program. The Army Heritage Trail serves as the USAC's outdoor museum and covers about one mile, highlighting nearly every era of Army history with different exhibits and large artifacts. Designed to provide an immersive experience that allows students to walk into each period of Army history, the trail also serves as a stage for our living history presentations. This exhibit represents British Way Station cabins along the Forbes Road in what is now Western Pennsylvania after the French and Indian War. Way stations preserve the vital British supply line by protecting troops moving west through the wilderness, as well as acting as a buffer between the towns of the east and the largely unsettled frontier. These buildings were a symbolic testament to British authority over the region. Good morning and welcome to the way station here at the Army uh, Heritage Education Center in Carlisle. Uh, today we're going to uh, take a little venture inside this cabin, explain to you some of the uh, things that I brought along with me that were used by the soldiers in the uh, 18th century. The French and Indian War was specifically um, started in 1756 and ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Here in the colonies it was known as the French and Indian War, however in Europe uh, it was known as and uh, referred to as the Seven Years War. You must remember at this time uh, we were all loyal subjects to the King of England and uh, when we go inside I think that will explain that a little more. As you come in the door to the way station, you'll notice right away the flag on the wall here. This is the British flag known as the King's Colors. As I said, we were all loyal subjects to the King of England. Some of the things that um, I brought along with me are hanging here on the wall is a backpack, uh, a snapsack made out of cowhide, and of course a haversack there hangs on the end. I do want to talk just a briefly about the important people that were involved in the French and Indian War. One, of course, was George Washington. Another important person was uh, General Edward Braddock. And uh, after uh, his uh, venture into western Pennsylvania, along came uh, General John Forbes. Now, when General Forbes uh, came on the scene from uh, Great Britain, he had about uh, 1,500 men with him. And his plan was to continually supply his men as they were marching and moving westward uh, towards the established fort of the French named Fort Duquesne. General Forbes uh, ordered the construction of way stations or supply depots, if you will, uh, that were utilized uh, to have a continuous supply line to his army. These the uh, way stations were. Um, uh, serviced by uh, wagon trains and pack horses. It was not uncommon to have a hundred pack horses come through uh, way station to way station. Initially there were only three of these established. Um, it was manned by a sergeant and up to six to eight privates uh, that were actually quartered in this room. Uh, the, the only uh, thing that is not uh, actually correct for this building is that there was a wall established across the doorways here uh, and this end of the building would have been just full of supplies. Anything that you can imagine that those soldiers would have needed uh, on the trail from tents and uh, cook kits, canteens, shoes, um, of course uh, gunpowder, musket balls, uh, tents, you name it, anything those guys needed uh, pass through these way stations. I'm going to talk a little bit about the weapon of the choice uh, during the French and Indian War. These were actually issued to the soldiers. Uh, this is a uh, brown vest. It's a 75 caliber. Uh, if you can notice in the muzzle that's three quarters of an inch uh, round ball. When we go to load this musket we would take a uh, cartridge out of our cartridge box, right, or belly box, because that's where it was carried. We would tear the tip off or bite the tip off of the uh, cartridge, pour a little powder into the pan, close the pan, 
pour the rest of the powder into the muzzle and the ball would go down the, the uh, muzzle. And we take our ramrod, insert it into the muzzle, seat it into the very bottom of the barrel, and now we're ready to fire. The firing mechanism, this would be all done according to uh, orders. Uh, these soldiers were very disciplined. We didn't do anything without a command. But to fire this musket, we would uh, come to the full cock, release the safety device or the, the uh, prison cover, shoulder, and the order would be given to fire. Now you'll notice that there was a spark uh, when I pulled the trigger, the uh, flint that's in the locking mechanism here would strike the prison and that would create a spark that would uh, ignite the powder that uh, we put in the pan when we loaded the, the gun. There's a little flash hole at the bottom of the pan here that would burn into the powder that's inside the barrel. Combustion would force the ball out the muzzle. These muskets were fairly accurate up to about 40 yards. Beyond that, uh, it was pretty much a hit or miss. You have to realize that when these soldiers in the uh, British Army and the Provincial Army, um, when they were given the order to fire their muskets, uh, they would come to the shoulder, and now there are probably as many as uh, three, four hundred men in a row. The whole idea here was to just fire your musket and, and force a, uh, the lead ball uh, at the enemy. Sometimes <clears throat> the soldiers would actually turn their head and pull the trigger to avoid getting powder burn on the left side of their face from the soldier who was standing shoulder uh, to the left of them. Uh, it was very uh, hit or miss kind of warfare. In fact, if the weather was bad, uh, they would parlay and, uh, and come into uh, the field or wherever they were fighting on another day. I'm going to show you, demonstrate how we would fix bayonets for a close encounter with the enemy. Re remove our bayonet from the uh, scabbard, put it on here, on the muzzle, it fits on there pretty securely. You'll notice that this bayonet is uh, hollowed out so that I can actually shoot uh, my musket while the bayonet is uh, on the musket. You'll notice that in this way station here there are some items that would have uh, passed through here from one uh, way station to another. There are barrels up on the shelf up there. Uh, some would have contained uh, gunpowder. Uh, some of the smaller ones actually would have been rum. The, the soldiers in the 18th century uh, look forward to their daily rum ration. Um, Around the sides, I, I have a couple of my bags that are hanging here. Most of the things uh, we needed the space to do school programs, so there's a lot of things that aren't in here. I mentioned earlier about uh, the shoes and all the tinware and everything. You'll also notice that in this cabin, in this way station, there are no windows or loopholes to shoot out of. By the time that uh, General Forbes uh, was marching westward, the real threat of Indian attack in this area uh, pretty much diminished. So the pr whole sole purpose of having this uh, building here uh, was to supply the army. Um, as I said, there was a uh, man by a sergeant and six to eight privates whose sole purpose was to maintain the king's property, maintain the, inv the inventory and keep it moving on. During, uh, after General Braddock's uh, defeat in 1755, uh, it left Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, Virginia uh, wide open to Indian raids. There was raids going on all over the place. Now, as a result of all these Indian raids, a lot of farms and uh, settlements were uh, destroyed. Farm farmers lost their crops. Uh, so by the time that the way stations appeared, the citizens uh, and the communities around Carlisle here uh, were in need of the same supplies that the army was getting and that was another reason to have the military presence here to uh, maintain the king's property. 
I set up a small display of some items that would have been uh, of use or uh, needed with the, uh, the light, daily life of a soldier. Uh, I have a small uh, collection here of uh, powder horns. Uh, some of them are very intricate, oh man, intricately uh, carved. And you'll notice that this one is is actually uh, one of my favorites. Uh, this is a um, a map horn. It shows uh, if we are right here in Carlisle. It shows the road to Shippensburg. We're going on out here through Bedford, on our way to uh, Fort Ligonier and then on to uh, Fort Duquesne, which was the French fort uh, that the British were trying to overtake. But there are some really uh, cool powder horn designs out there. This one looks like a whale, uh, his mouth where he's coming up there, the teeth on the whale. Uh, some of the soldiers had more personal information on their powder horn. Uh, this one here has like a saying on it a man of word and not of deeds is like a garden full of weeds. And uh, there is the, I'm a member of the 3rd Battalion of Pennsylvania Provincials, the Augusta Regiment, but you can see uh, how intricate the uh, carvings were on those horns. One of the reasons for the French and Indian War was not only for uh, land possession in western Pennsylvania known as the Ohio Territory, but there was a very lucrative business going on in Europe with the fur trade. There was lots of uh, demand for beaver pelts. And I brought with me a beaver pelt here this morning. This is a pretty good example of the size and all of the average beaver at that time. Um, it was very lucrative. There was lots of money to be made. Um, in fact, the uh, governor of uh, Virginia, Robert Dinwiddie, was uh, um, on the board, uh, he was a stockholder in a company that was doing um, uh, trading with um, the uh, natives here uh, to send pelts back to Europe. So it was a uh, very profit, uh, profitable business for them. Also I have with me is a um, soldiers in the 18th century were clean shaven. There is a uh, bar of uh, lye soap. Uh, a razor and a small mirror that the, the soldiers would use to uh, shave. They were uh, basically clean shaven. Some utensils, I have a pewter spoon, a fork, and I, uh, it's a homemade knife, a bowl. The copper uh, pot there is what they call a boiler. Uh, he would uh, heat up some dried uh, beans or something in that uh, for his meal. And of course my cup. Also, I have on the table here these two little iron things. These are called cow troughs, and they would put those around on the perimeter uh, of their encampment to uh, ward off anybody uh, who want, would like to do them harm, mainly Indians. When the Indians were walking around their uh, encampment at night, the soft sole moccasins, if they'd step on one of those, uh, that would do great damage to the soles of her. Uh, foot. These uh, caltrops were used for thousands of years. Uh, I think initially they started out for to um, injure camels uh, that were approaching an encampment and then later horses or cavalry. Uh, but right through the French and Indian War these were used uh, for several hundred years even after the French and Indian War. Also I brought with me as a tobacco twist I'm going to hold that up. It's in the shadow there. It's a tobacco twist. That's uh, some fine tobacco from Virginia. And of course, the uh, soldiers would have enjoyed a uh, uh, smoke in the evening. All right, well, Private Hackenberg, that was a really great presentation. I've got a few questions for you. Uh, the first one is How long did the French and Indian War actually last? Well, the war was officially declared in 1756 ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Here in the colonies it was known as the French and Indian War. Uh, however, in Europe it was known as the Seven Years War. This conflict actually started two years before the war was uh, officially declared. 
1754, two years before uh, the war was officially declared, George Washington um, ventured into western Pennsylvania. Uh, he discovered a small French patrol. Uh, a skirmish ensued, and the French, off the French officer was actually uh, of that small patrol was actually executed. He went back to his uh, location where he had set up camp in a place called the Great Meadows. Uh, it wasn't long until he received word that he was being pursued by a French army that, that uh, came out of uh, Fort Duquesne. So to protect his Virginians, Washington orders the construction of a small stockaded fort and named the Fort Necessity out of the necessity to protect his uh, soldiers. Uh, there were some extenuating circumstances on the day that the battle occurred. It was pouring down rain. Um, his uh, men could not fire their muskets. The gunpowder had gotten wet. Uh, he was taking heavy casualties, so he was actually forced to surrender. But then the uh, confusion in the uh, translation of the French document of surrender, uh, what the document actually said was that Washington um, killed the French officer. He, uh, he, he signed this letter not knowing what the full content of it was and he was allowed to return to uh, Virginia. And after the document was properly uh, translated, we found out that what Washington actually signed was a confession uh, that he was the one who uh, killed that French officer and actually started the French and Indian War two years before the war was officially declared. Wow. It, the war, I must say, uh, uh, went on and continued to, here in Pennsylvania and uh, the province of New York until about uh, 1760 uh, when the uh, British uh, won a very decisive victory in uh, Co uh, Quebec in the Plains of Abraham and they actually uh, was a short time later when they were able to take over uh, the French capital then Quebec. So uh, that was in 1760. So that was pretty much the end of the fighting here in North America. However, however this was a, a global conflict. There was not only fighting here in uh, the Americas, but there was fighting in Africa and India. And it was certainly in Europe, it was uh, a, a truly a worldwide uh, global conflict.